Good evening. Don, I like your bow tie. They're coming into fashion again. We are going to start out with hymn number 228, Rejoice, the Lord is King. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. I know that comes as a surprise to you. 228, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. We thank you that you loved us enough that you sent Jesus to pay the ultimate sacrifice for our sin, that he took our punishment on the cross that we deserved. We pray tonight as we go to your word that you'll give us hearts that are open and willing to receive your word and to let that take an effect on our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You can thank Wyatt for that. I don't want him getting the best of me. Hymn number 231 is our next hymn this evening. Jesus shall reign. 231 in your hymnals.
Very good singing. Brief survey, not that I'm going to maybe do anything different because of it, but I'm just curious. How many of you would rather sing standing up? Okay. How many of you like to have a break and sit down once in a while? Okay. Good to know. I appreciate your input. It's as far as we'll go with that. At this time, we're going to have a break for a scripture reading. You get to sit for almost the entire service, right? You sing much better when you're standing, even if it's not your preference. Well, I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles for our scripture reading to the book of Jeremiah. And tonight we'll be reading in Jeremiah chapter 6. Once again, the Lord is warning his people about the consequences that are coming on them because of their sin and their disobedience. That, of course, was mostly what Jeremiah's ministry as a prophet consisted of. And so he is warning once again of the judgment that is about to come on Jerusalem. Jeremiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Flee for safety, O people of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal on Beth Hakarem, for disaster looms out of the north and great destruction. The lovely and delicately bred I will destroy, the daughter of Zion. Shepherds with their flocks shall come against her. They shall pitch their tents around her. They shall pasture each in his place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us attack at noon. Woe to us, for the day declines, for the shadows of evening lengthen. Arise and let us attack by night and destroy her palaces. For thus says the Lord of hosts, cut down her trees Cast up a siege mound against Jerusalem. This is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make you a desolation, an uninhabited land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall glean thoroughly as a vine, the remnant of Israel. Like a grape gatherer, pass your hand again over its branches. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Therefore, I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. Pour it out upon the children in the street and upon the gatherings of young men also. Both husband and wife shall be taken, the elderly and the very aged. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. I set watchmen over you, saying, Pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not pay attention. Therefore hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. What use to me is frankincense that comes from Sheba, or sweet cane from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is pleasing to me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lay before this people stumbling blocks against which they shall stumble. Fathers and sons together, neighbor and friend, shall perish. 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, a people is coming from the north country. A great nation is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. They lay hold on bow and javelin. They are cruel and have no mercy. The sound of them is like the roaring sea. They ride on horses, set in array as a man for battle. Against you, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the report of it. Our hands fall helpless. Anguish has taken hold of us, pain as of a woman in labor. Go not out into the field, nor walk on the road, for the enemy has a sword. Terror is on every side. O daughter of my people, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for suddenly the destroyer will come upon us. I have made you a tester of metals among my people, that you may know and test their ways. They are all stubbornly rebellious, going about with slanders. They are bronze and iron. All of them act corruptly. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. In vain, the refining goes on. For the wicked are not removed. Rejected silver, they are called. For the Lord has rejected them. I can almost imagine a homiletics professor telling Jeremiah, that his message is too negative. He needs to insert just a little bit of joy, just a little bit of hope, just a little bit of buoyancy into his preaching ministry. And no doubt there are some preachers who seem to make a a, a career of negative preaching, and there there is certainly great joy and hope to balance out the negative messages of Scripture. But I am struck by just how heavy this message is that Jeremiah has to deliver. And sometimes when it comes right down to it, people just don't want to hear those hard messages. When you read a chapter like that, do you think about our nation? Does it remind you of our culture, the world that you and I inhabit? It certainly does me. And yet I have to ask myself whether I am fully impacted by that heavy message, whether I view my sin in the way that God wants our culture to view our sin. There is the danger that we would be like those that he describes that are not going to hear. And because of that, they are going to be subjected to the Lord's judgment. So even as we acknowledge the fact that we live in a society that is deserving in many ways of God's judgment, we also recognize our own need individually to respond to the Lord and to humble ourselves before him. And certainly there is an example in Jeremiah that we would not say peace, peace when there is no peace. We want to certainly point people to the truth. And that really is where hope is found because if you respond in the right way to a hard message like this, then there is restoration and there is forgiveness. So may the Lord encourage us to respond the right way to the danger of the Lord's judgment if we continue down paths of sin uh, by our reading in Jeremiah this evening. Zach? Zach? Stuff. 234 in your hymnal. You just sat for a long time. Come on. If you're able, please join me in standing. It's not that I don't care about your opinion. Please don't take it that way. Just that I like mine better. 234. Crown him with many crowns.
Amen. Very good singing. One more hymn. I saw you getting ready to try to sit down. If you need to, you can. I will not stop you. But I would love it if you continue to stand with me on our final hymn, We Shall Behold Him, 237 in your hymnal, 237, We Shall Behold Him. You sing so well when you're standing up, right? You may be seated. Thank you. I 
sense God's presence. And I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is a temple Jehovah God abides here. And we are standing in his presence on holy ground. We are standing trusting all of you turned your microphones off, otherwise we might have an interesting situation here. Or so Mike told me. Well, we have come this evening in our study of the book of Daniel to Daniel chapter 7, so I'll invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn to that chapter. And Daniel 7 really does represent an important turning point in the book, and in some ways it's a daunting turning point. Um, it's interesting that the book seems to take a much more challenging turn as we get to the second half of the book. And you may remember that from our discussion about the structure of the book of Daniel early on in this series. So 
you may recall that it can be divided into two parts. You have the first six chapters, and what do those chapters focus on? Focuses on the stories, focuses on the narratives. These are the stories that you learned about when you were in Sunday school. Um, when you were in Sunday school as a kid, your teacher probably chose to skip over the second half of the book, and you'll understand why that is as we dig into some of these trickier passages. But there is so much encouragement, there is so much for us to be inspired by as we consider the great things that the second half of this book has to teach us. So that really is the major division of the book of Daniel. The first half, the first six six chapters are basically the stories about Daniel and his three friends. And then the final six chapters are basically prophecies. Now, Daniel, of course, has already engaged in some of this. We saw this with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, for instance. Uh, But he is going to emphasize that in a much more focused manner, beginning now with chapter 7. Now, you'll be interested, perhaps, to know that we are still in a section of the book that is written in Aramaic. That's something that we noticed early on, all the way back in chapter 2. Much of the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic because that was the language of the Gentile nations at that time. And once we get past chapter 7, we're going to be back in the Hebrew section. Now, you won't really notice that. It won't really affect you that much one way or another. But it is a reminder, I think, to us that Daniel 7 is is really central to the book of Daniel because it's a hinge point. It's a a point of overlap between those two structural parts of this book. And so when we get to especially the middle of Daniel 7, I think you'll see why that's significant, what what it is focusing our attention on in this chapter. So you'll notice right away that Daniel's going to start referring to himself a lot more in the first person. He's going to use words like I, words like me. We didn't get to see that earlier in the book of Daniel. And you'll also notice that chapter 7 and then also chapter 8 is out of chronological order. So if you're looking now at Daniel 7, I'll direct your attention to verse 1. Notice what it says at the beginning. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So where does that place the events that we're about to read about tonight in Daniel 7? Yeah, before the handwriting on the wall and before the takeover by the the Medo-Persian Empire as well, right? So all of the stuff about Daniel in the lion's den, that has not happened yet. And the handwriting on the wall and that great feast that Belshazzar held that he should not have held, that has not happened yet. So this is earlier on after probably most of Daniel's interactions with Nebuchadnezzar, but before the events of those those last two chapters that we've been looking at. So if you want to rearrange things in chronological order just to kind of help you follow the way things fit uh, in the book, you would have to move chapters 7 and 8 in between chapters 4 and 5. That's where you would have to place chapters 7 and 8 in order to fit it into the rest of the book chronologically. Now, why would Daniel choose not to put chapters 7 and 8 there? Because he's giving us prophecies. And so he's going to focus our attention very heavily on future events from now right all the way through till the end of the book. So that seems to be the logic behind the structure of the book. So with that as a little bit of background and opener, I'll invite you to read with me Uh, the first section of Daniel 7, beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. 
It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Do you track with all that? Are you confused yet? It's a lot for us to keep track of. And that's really reflective of the section of the book of Daniel that we have come to. But let's see if we can sort things out a little bit so we can follow the prophecy that Daniel is being given. So this is a revelation that's occurring at the beginning of Belshazzar's reign. That would be a co-reign, as it would seem, with his father, Nabonidus. We've mentioned him before. He doesn't seem to have spent much of his reign actually around Babylon. And so he doesn't seem to have been in the picture very much but this was early on in the co-reign of Belshazzar with his father, Nabonidus. And you might notice some similarities between the vision that we just read about and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had way back in chapter two. Do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about in chapter two? That was the statue, right, that was made of all the gold, all, all of those metals, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron. And do you remember what those metals represented? Those were nations under the rule of kings. The Lord was revealing the future to Nebuchadnezzar. And that seems to be what the Lord is doing once again through a different dream, through a different vision now that Daniel has had. And like that initial dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, there are four kingdoms. And it spans all the way from human history at that point to the end times. Now, there's a reference there in, uh, in the beginning of that passage that we just read to the Great Sea. That probably refers to the Mediterranean Sea. There are other places in the Bible where the Great Sea is used to describe the Mediterranean Sea. And what's interesting is if we identified the four nations correctly when we were back in Daniel chapter 2, those nations are closely connected with the Mediterranean, aren't they? Right? So what were those nations that we identified? The Babylonian Empire right? That was the head of gold. What was the next one? The Medo-Persian Empire, and then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire, right? So those all would have been at one time in their history adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea. So that kind of seems to confirm that understanding of Nebuchadnezzar's dream back in chapter 2, and it fits well with what we see going on here as well. Now, those four winds, there, there are a lot of different explanations for different details in this, in this passage. It seems best to me to just think that they're talking about four different directions. That's the simplest way to understand that. You could come up with symbolism beyond that, but I'm not sure I see a reason in the text to read more into the four winds than just that. And then the beasts, of course, are four kings representing their kingdoms. Now, like most of the difficult passages in this book, there are different interpretations. What I am going to present to you is my interpretation based on the best understanding that I have. If you disagree with me on some of these details, we don't need to uh, get in a fight over it or anything like that. Uh, but I do think that the traditional conservative interpretation of this passage holds, it holds together pretty well. Um, and the traditional view is that these four beasts describe those four kingdoms that we have just described. And so that would mean that the lion, the winged lion, represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. And then the bear would represent Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire. The leopard then would represent Greece. And then what would the beast represent? See, this is where things get interesting once, once, you, once you follow that, gen, that general alignment of kingdoms and symbolism, you think, okay, we're good. We've, we've just reached the Roman Empire, right? The problem is we're talking about a beast that is not named more specifically than that. And as we continue to work our way through this chapter, we're going to see some remarkable similarities to a character named the beast that the book of Revelation talks about. And so it becomes apparent, I think, as we work our way through this chapter, that what Daniel is seeing is the whole span of human history, but there's a major jump forward that takes place in there. And so some, some commentators describe the Roman Empire, as Daniel describes it, um, as uh, the Roman Empire A, Roman Empire B, 
right? So you've got almost two parts. And I think that that explains pretty well what's going on here. And I think that will fit with our understanding of the beast as we learn a little bit more about him as we work our way through here. So that description of a winged lion, have any of you ever seen pictures of any of the artifacts or the ruins from Babylon? Maybe you've seen a picture of the reconstruction of the Babylonian gates. It's actually, it's actually really fascinating. There are images of winged lions. That was something that the Babylonians apparently made use of in their, in their art, in their mythology. And so that was what the Lord seems to have used to represent the kingdom of Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what do you think is going on with that wing plucking and that giving of a man's mind that we read about? Well, you could, you could I, I suppose, come up with different explanations. I sort of see Nebuchadnezzar's experience in chapter four. Remember when he was humbled and he became like an animal and then the Lord finally gave him his mind back and really, I think, gave him a new heart at the same time. That sort of seems to me reminiscent of Nebuchadnezzar's experience there. Um, and again, that, that explanation is not given in detail, but you can look at that and compare it with the rest of the book and see if it's satisfying to your mind as you read this. So the bear then would most likely point to Persia. What is going on with that raised side? Well, again, minimal explanation that we're working with here. But we understand that the kingdom of Persia was not one single entity, right? It was the Medo-Persian Empire. And so it could very well be pointing out the fact that the Persian part of that partnership was the stronger, was the more dominant side of that alliance. And so that could be what's going on there when you see that raised side. That's certainly one suggestion that has been put forward. And it seems as good to me as any of the other explanations that you'll read about for that raised side. What about the three ribs? I'm just going to say territories. Because again, scholars are going to come up with a lot of explanations for what kinds of lands, what kind of cities those might represent. But it seems to me that what you have going on here is you have territory being conquered. Um, perhaps it's referring to directions. The directions might be north, west, and south. That would sort of fit with what's going on in the context here. And then, of course, that brings us to this leopard. But to call it a leopard doesn't quite do it justice, does it? Is this like a leopard you've seen pictures of? No, not, not at all. Um, and this is a four-winged leopard and a four-headed leopard, right? Why would Daniel see such a strange leopard? Well, because this is prophecy, right? This is symbolizing something that is about to happen. This is pointing to something that will happen later on in the future. And if you study the history of the Greek empire, then what you come to understand is that that was a unified empire only for a very short length of time. So who conquered the land that formed the Greek empire? Mostly Alexander the Great. His father started the process, but he pretty much finished it. And it didn't really continue much beyond him. And after he died, it's rumored that he said something to his generals like, well, let, let the strong div divvy it up, right? And so that was what ended up happening. Over a period of decades, different generals were engaged in a political struggle with one another. And at the end of it all, there were basically four generals who came out as being on top. And so that Greek empire ended up being divided basically into four different sections. Could that explain why we have a four-headed leopard? I think so, again, because the vision is not meant to describe to us what a leopard is. You and I know what a leopard is. The vision is being given to describe what is going to happen historically. And that fits very well with the succession of empires that we're seeing in this symbolism. Now, the last beast is not described as a beast that you or I are familiar with. It's only described as terrifying, dreadful, and exceedingly strong. It has iron teeth and 10 horns, which would seem to point to 10 different kingdoms. Now, the horn in Old Testament literature and in the ancient world, that's a symbol of strength. So these horns, whenever you see these horns, they're representative of the strength and the power of a kingdom. And sometimes one of them will overcome another. But in any case, the horn is meant to signify the strength of a kingdom. Now, do you see this beast fitting well 
with our understanding of the historical Roman Empire. That was the connection we made back in chapter two, wasn't it? Well, if you see this as fitting with the historical Roman Empire, then you have to figure out what you do with these 10 kingdoms, right? And there are scholars who have tried to come up with explanations for which, these, which of these kingdoms are going to fit that bill of those 10 kingdoms. But when you compare what Daniel is going to reveal about this beast to what the book of Revelation says about a man who is called the beast, then I think it makes a lot more sense to fast forward in history and see this as Roman Empire Part 2 or Roman Empire Part B. I think that that is what is going on here. We'll, we'll, we'll continue to work through that as, as we go, and you can, you can see if that fits with your understanding as well. Well, this little horn that we see here, it, um, just a, as a heads up, this is not the same little horn we're going to encounter in the next chapter, so we're gonna need to keep our horns straight as we work our way through this section because there are different horns that apply in different situations. And this horn, as I understand it, seems to be pointing to the Antichrist, who indeed will speak words against the Most High. That is what he will do. And so this sets events far in the future, even beyond the point where you and I are now. Which raises the question, is that the end? You have this great and terrible beast that is not even described other than the fact that it's just great and terrible. And so the question is, what comes Next, is he the final word? Well, let's continue reading now in verse nine. Verse nine says, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Now again, who have I suggested that horn is? Antichrist, okay? And see if that fits with the description that is given next. And as I looked... The beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So when are the events that you and I just read about taking place? Have they happened yet? No, this is pointing to something that is still future. And I would suggest that this is actually pointing to the great white throne judgment. That seems to be the best explanation for the picture that we have here. And we've come, we've come to a place where we are seeing God's sovereignty displayed in incredibly powerful and momentous ways. What is the theme of the book of Daniel? God is the sovereign of history. And we are seeing here at the center of the book and at the center of this description of the the kingdoms of man that are still to come in Daniel's day, we are seeing the Lord's sovereignty and the Lord's control over all of the nations and even the great and dreadful and terrifying beast. We are seeing his sovereignty and his reign and his rule. The thrones are placed for the ancient of days to sit in judgment. And who would you expect the ancient of days to be? I think we're talking about God the Father. And the reason why I think it's God the Father even though we acknowledge that Jesus is ancient of days as well, is because Jesus will, will play into this in a few verses from here. And so the ancient of days I would see as God the Father. And again, that, that points to this being the great white throne judgment as opposed to the judgment seat of Christ or something like that. And there's all sorts of symbolism that we see here. Those of you who have been in the adult Sunday school class studying Revelation, this is symbolism that you're familiar with, Right? This is symbolism that you recognize. And so the white clothing would indicate purity. The white hair would indicate great age and great wisdom. As you think about the burning fire, that would once again indicate God's purity and his unapproachability. God is truly the one who is equipped to judge the earth. And this is what he is describing through this vision to Daniel at this point. 
And so these people now are going to be judged, and they're going to be judged on the basis of God's records. So you see these books that are brought out, and those are God's records of people's deeds. You see those also in the book of Revelation. Now, is the Lamb's book of life mentioned here? Do you see that? I don't see it mentioned specifically, but there is a book that reminds me of the Lamb's Book of Life that is mentioned later on in Daniel chapter 12. If you'd like to, you can go ahead and turn over there just briefly with me so you can see that. So Daniel 12, uh, in verse 1, starts by talking about Michael, the great prince. Um, And then it goes on to say, There shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now again, this is not just one of the books. This is the book. And I would see that as being a reference to the Lamb's Book of Life. Again, lots of connections between the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel that we see as we work our way through this section. Well, in the face of God's judgment, what does this beast do? He just keeps on doing the same, the same stuff he's been doing, right? He continues to speak against the Most High, only to be completely destroyed and then to be burned in the fire. And lest we think that that fire is metaphorical, all we would have to do is turn once again to the book of Revelation, and it describes that situation where the beast is then cast into the lake of fire. You can read about that in Revelation 19 and Revelation 20. So that shows us God's ultimate victory. At the very end, when when humanity is faced with its greatest spiritual threat, God will overcome that spiritual threat completely. His people will be on the winning side. Well, as we continue working our way through this glorious vision of God's judgment, God's power, God's sovereignty, he says in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So do you see why we identified the Ancient of Days as God the Father earlier in this section? Because we have the Son of Man who is coming with the clouds of heaven. And who is that? That is Jesus. That is God the Son. And this reminds me a lot of something that Jesus alludes to at his trial before the great, the great council. And so I'll invite you to turn over now to Matthew chapter 26, because this is, I think, one of the most important connections that we can make in Daniel 7 with our New Testaments. Have you ever wondered why Jesus would call himself the Son of Man? I used to wonder about that when I was a kid. I didn't have a problem believing that Jesus was man. I didn't have a problem believing that he was human. The question that I felt really needed to be answered is, well, is he God? Because that's what Christians believe, and yet Jesus didn't go around calling himself God explicitly very often. He instead referred to himself as the Son of Man. Well, what does that expression, Son of Man, mean? I think Jesus makes it clear as he's standing before Caiaphas. So I'll direct your attention to Matthew 26, beginning to read in verse 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered. And Peter was following him in a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. What does Jesus say? That he is the Son of God? No. In verse 64, he says, You have said so, 
But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Does that remind you of what we just read about in Daniel? So when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he is not only saying that he is human. He is saying that. But he is specifically pointing out something from the book of Daniel that is very, very significant. And if there's any question in our minds as to whether it is significant, all you have to do is listen to the response of the high priest, right? What does he say when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, who will be seated at the right hand of power and come on the clouds of heaven? The high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. He knew what Jesus was alluding to. He knew that Jesus was pointing back to Daniel chapter 7 and identifying himself as the one that God was going to give an eternal kingdom to. And so that, that just really, I think, helps us to understand why Jesus would refer to himself as the Son of Man, because that was a, an important theological principle that had been set up in the Old Testament. And it means much more than just that he is man. It means that he is, in fact, God who is being given an eternal kingdom. We see that in that connection with Daniel chapter 7. So if I were you, I might just go ahead and write Daniel 7 in the margin of my, of my Bible there in Matthew 26, because that will help you to understand the significance of what Jesus says about himself as he's standing before the high priest. All right, well, with that, I'll invite you to turn back to the book of Daniel once more, and this is where we will finish out this evening. Well, I don't know how you would feel about all this, but here's how Daniel felt about it. In verse 15, as for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. And here's where we get some of the explanation that we've already worked through as we think about the significance of these beasts. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions." As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So once again, I'll pause briefly just to ask the question, does this sound to you like the historical Roman Empire? Or does this sound like a future empire that is described in the book of Revelation? This sounds to me like a future empire that the book of Revelation describes. Again, sort of stretching out that concept of the Roman Empire because you have that connection, right? Do you remember the metal that described the Roman Empire in chapter two? It was iron. Did you notice the iron teeth that this, that this beast has? I think we're meant to see a Roman connection, but again, this is not quite the Roman connection that you and I think of based on our history class that we took back when we were in high school. This is a little bit different what we see going on here. So verse 23, thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the 10 horns, out of this kingdom, 10 kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. What do you think that's referring to? Again, Revelation, right? So this, this maybe is not something that we instinctively understand as English speakers, but what's being described here is a time, and then times is not just any number of times, that's two times, right? So how many times are we up to? Three, and then how much more? Half a time, right? And so that is clearly describing that period in the Great Tribulation. Um, that seems to be a very close connection. Once again, you put all these details, these comparisons together, and you are able to see, I think, really beautifully just how Daniel fits in 
with the history of Revelation. In other words, we haven't got there yet, but our world is headed there in a hurry. And so that is something that you and I have to look forward to. Not the tribulation, I trust. Um, we, we as Christians, uh, we believe that we do not have to look forward to enduring that tribulation with the rest of this world. There are other Christians who do believe that, uh, but it seems very clear to me as I study Scripture that that is not something that the Lord has ordained for us as his people. But that will be a time of great and terrible devastation on this world, and that seems to be the focus of this, of this part of Daniel's revelation. So verse 26, But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So what is the end of the matter? In the end, God wins. That, that is the end of everything. And that's God's encouragement to us in a world that is oftentimes our enemy. When we look around us and we see people turning away from the truth, when we see unrighteousness lifted up as if it's righteousness, as if it's a good thing, we have to understand that the end of the matter is not what we see going on around us. This world will not have the final verdict. Even when you have the great and terrible beast that you can't even think of an animal to describe what that, what that person is going to be like. God will deal with that and he will judge and he will reign forever and ever at the end of it all. And so that is our hope. Our hope is an eternal hope. If our hope is in the things of this world, then we're probably going to lose hope. We're going to be downhearted. We are going to be discouraged as we look around us. But if our hope is future, then we can be filled with joy and peace and confidence as we go through life day to day. And I trust that that's an encouragement to you to think about as you look at this new week with the challenges that it holds for you and for all of us individually. Well, there is this glorious vision of Christ that is placed strategically right in the middle of that chapter that you and I just read. It's hard to think of a much more exalted passage in Scripture uh, or a ex much more exalted passage in the book of Daniel that we've been considering. But that raises the question, are we living for that kingdom? Or are we living for the kingdom that we find ourselves in today? Are we living for this world? John tells us that the world is passing away with all of its desires. God is going to completely wipe all of that away. He is going to remove it. It is not going to last. If you and I are living for the things of this world, then that is only going to be temporary. That will not bring lasting satisfaction. But if you are living for the Lord and for his kingdom, then that is going to be where real hope, real satisfaction, and real joy is found. So can, can I just encourage all of us this week to stop pursuing sin, to stop pursuing this world, to stop living for the temporary pleasures that we think that this world can offer us, because that is not our hope. In the end, we are looking for another kingdom. And so let's keep our focus on that kingdom, and not just the kingdom, but on its king because that truly is what is supposed to be our focus as we go through this Christian life together. Well, Zach took just about all of the good songs about Jesus' kingship this, uh, this, this evening. I think he sort of looked at our theme tonight and put two and two together. But I would like us to conclude by singing a song that testifies to our confidence in the reign of our Savior. So we're just going to stand and conclude our service tonight by singing Majesty. It uh, won't take us very long, uh, but I hope that you can sing that from your heart because Jesus is your king and you are looking forward to experiencing his reign in its fullness one of these days. Uh, 74, sorry. I know none of you care about that anymore. <laughs>
May the Lord enable us by the way we live our lives this week to give testimony to the fact that he does reign in the world and he reigns in our hearts as well. Thank you. You are dismissed.